Good, excellent. So I thought I'd talk about things which are actually at an angle to what Toby's just talked about. And I want to review some of the um, theories which inform our understanding of behavior. But I start from the assumption that changing behavior is not very easy. And most of the work that I do takes, places in, takes place in uh, parts of the world which don't have quite such simple problems as the nudge unit is dealing with. But I think some of those could be dealt with in that way. So three ways to think about behavior change. One is one that Toby's just mentioned, which is the question of rationality. And I shall talk about type 1 and type 2 thinking as well, um, but some other aspects. The other is that part of our behavior has very deep evolutionary roots. And the third aspect is the socio-cultural aspects of behavior, by which I mean not just what people believe, and that people come from different cultures which start from different assumptions, but also there are power structures and there are constraints on how we can behave because of power structures, ec economic factors, and these kinds of understandings can be applied to all kinds of personal behaviours, whether it's the use of antimicrobials by farmers, prescribing by doctors, demand for antimicrobials by patients or veterinary clients. Anywhere where you're talking about behaviour modification, these kinds of issues are at play. So let's start from the, the rational perspective. And rationality is not a straightforward thing. Um, I thought I'd put in Kant, because I know that all vets have always read great philosophers. It doesn't matter whether you haven't. But the point is that Kant drew a distinction between formal rationality, which is the algebra of making, uh, of, problem, of, of expressing a problem and understanding a problem, and practical rationality, which is dealing with the problem as it there, is there in front of you in, in a practical sense. And very often, we're not formally rational, even when we are being rational. And this is very much about type one and type two thinking. Panicking, which is a very deeply evolved response to certain situations, is not necessarily what you would do if you had time to think about it much more carefully. And the other thing which is worth thinking about is that human beings, here called actors, because that's what social scientists often call human beings, agents, um, have understandings of situations which may be quite other than those which are purely rational. For example, they may believe in fairies, or they may believe in ghosts, or they may have deeply held superstitions. Even the most rational among us, even those who are deeply scientific in their approach to life, have things they're ashamed to tell, like, for example, somebody I know who keeps a money plant in their house. Now, how many people in this audience own a money plant? Yes. And how many people in this audience would even begin to admit that they think that the money plant influences their wealth? <laughs> Thank you. There's one, there's one honest person in this audience. I know a very distinguished scientist who keeps a money plant in their... I'm not even going to use their gender. Who keeps a money plant in their house. And they believe this money plant has to be kept very carefully because suddenly at one stage in their life when they're very hard up, Someone gave them a money plant, and their finances changed. So meanings of situations, what we actually deeply believe about what is going on, may be very important and beyond the rational. So the meanings that people attach to situations, their understanding of what is going on, may be very different from ours. And they may think they're rational. The second set of factors are probably tied very closely to what Kahneman calls type one thinking. One of my, two of my colleagues at the London School of Hygiene, um, Andra and Curtis, published a very interesting book a couple of years ago called Gaining Control, How Human, Being, How Human Behavior Evolved. And the interesting thing about this book is that it distinguishes between different kinds of human behavior as having different periods of, uh, of having appeared at different developments in our evolution. So there are early uh, behaviors such as lust, good idea, reproduction, hunger, fueling reproduction, comfort, looking after children, fear, 
keeping away from predators. Disgust, keeping away from things that might eat you or might harm you. Even amoeba, apparently, show a, a revulsion com, uh, uh, response. So that's a very early evolved behavior, but it's within us, and Kahneman indeed discusses it and talks about it, or some of the followers of Kahneman discuss it, in relation to particular parts of the brain. And then there's um, later kinds of behaviors, those which are not concerned with immediate survival, but with longer, uh, 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 longer term thinking or longer term behaviors. Curiosity, playing, hoarding. Hoarding is a very interesting one. We all think saving is a good thing, or most of us think saving is a good thing. Well, that seems to be a later evolved behavior. And finally, there are really complex, much later, often thought of as typically human, I don't think they are, um, evolved behaviors involving executive control, um, dealing with end states, uh, working out strategies, those kinds of things. And that's why uh, Andrew and Curtis call their book Gaining Control, because it's that process of ultimately moving towards, it's a very simplistic uh, evolutionary picture actually, almost 19th century, of gaining, moving towards gaining control. Now, the reason I gave my lecture the title that I gave it, blood, lust, etc., is that advertisers, of course, know all about these things and have done for many, many decades. Because not only do they understand these things intuitively, they also fit it into our own particular cultural framework. They know the market, and advertisements differ from society to society. So I thought I'd put up a number of, of little symbols here that I just took off the web uh, from insurance adverts. So here's the rational one at the top right-hand corner of the screen. How much do you need to save for your retirement? Well, it's not quite simple rational, is it? Because it's the one, I guess there aren't many people in this audience who remember the old prudential adverts they used to have in the newspapers when I was a, a child, which I puzzled about when I was aged about seven or eight, um, where you had a young chap who said, oh, I understand my job has a pension with it. I, in other words, I don't really think about it. And then he goes through every decade until he's about 65, and he's old and wrinkled, and he says, I don't know what I'm going to do because I never saved for a pension. This is a kind of a fairly straightforward uh, attitude towards getting people to think about retirement and saving. But here we have some other, some other images. There's a piece of ladies' underwear. There's a solid leather boot. There's people having a holiday. And my goodness me, there's a very nice shiny car there. These are also things to do with retirement. And they're not dealing with, with rational responses. They're dealing with much more emotional responses. And here's some of the things that appear as the prompts which insurers use. Security, responsibility, guarantee, peace of mind, protection. All these things are engaging with the rational and also the deeply long ago worried, wor the worries that come from deeply long ago evolved responses, behaviors. So now to move away from the insurance industry to Bangladeshi poultry, mar poultry market workers, and how do they relate to pandemic influenza risk? Uh, this is where I do most of my research. Um, one of the questions that people ask when they're confronted, uh, people who ask me about my work, they say, well, why don't you just tell them they should clean up their points of slaughter? Why don't you just tell them that they should practice biosecurity around their farms? Well, of course, just telling people doesn't work terribly well. It assumes that there is a rational response to a piece of information, but it doesn't understand the rationales which underlie people's behaviors, the meanings of the situations to them. So Bangladeshi poultry market workers who are dealing with slaughtering a handful of chickens in one go all day, 12 chickens, say a prayer, say a prayer. Lots of dead chickens. Working in very, very stressful situation. 
sometimes played on a piece rate basis. So three kinds of risk are going on, apart from the risk of actually spreading uh, droplet infections, which contain quite high levels of virus. Um, livelihood, livelihood risk. If they have to slow down, then their income is going to decline. If they wear protective equipment, then it means that actually they're going to be able to work less fast. So income goes down. So they're prepared to take the health risks associated with cuts and grazes, with inhalation of market dust, which has quite a large viral load, uh, apart from the aesthetic business of the heat in Bangladesh and the bad smells. And then there's the ritual risk. You might slaughter the ch chickens in the wrong way. These chickens are supposed to be halal. So you've got to be able to do it in the way which you believe to be correct practice of halal and which satisfies your customers who want to see you do halal slaughter. So the messages that you would have to address to people in those situations to change their behavior would need to be engaging with those quite complex factors in their lives. And then there is another factor, which is not to be underestimated, which is the theatre of manhood. Because men working in difficult conditions, doing dangerous, and in this case, blood and death related things, are doing something to do with manhood. Uh, one of my first pieces of research on health was with Sheffield steel workers. And one of the things they didn't want to wear for a number of reasons, one of which was uncomfortable, was protective equipment because it didn't fit with the theatre of manhood. So in practice, in the Bangladesh example, market workers don't engage with pandemic influenza. It's too remote in time and effect for them to give attention to it. What they do is they get on with killing chickens. Here's another example. Um, veterinary practitioners who overprescribe antibiotics. There are structural factors at work here, and I said socio-cultural earlier on in this talk, and I mentioned then that this included structural factors. The structures within which we live our lives influence our decision taking. In the case of prescribing practices, the factors of relevance which may affect those may be the age and gender of veterinary or medical practitioners. Let's deal with veterinary practitioners. There's been a marked feminization of the veterinary profession in the last decades. So many young vets are women, and women follow a different life course for men because they tend to have children. And for that reason, as they move through their professional career, they may find at certain times it's suitable to be working on a contract to a large corporate practice. And furthermore, in recent decades, corporate practices have increased as a proportion of all practices. So the contractual position of the veterinary practitioner may actually require that they follow certain kinds of prescribing requirements which have to do with agreements between the veterinary practice and the pharmaceutical company and profit margins. And so therefore the business structure of the practice and the age and gender of the veterinary practitioner may result in more prescription of antibiotics than may be strictly necessary. So that would seem to suggest three questions. In trying to change people's behavior, should you go for the visceral, the early evolved responses, the early behaviors, the blood, the lust, all that disgust? Or should you go for the structural, the structures within which people do their prescribing or do whatever it is, whether it's uh, trying to protect the animals or, um, or, or whether it's trying to uh, to um, prescribe particular kinds of, of, of medications? Or should you go for the rational messages? Perhaps we really have to listen, we have to listen to and learn from madmen. Who, who has not seen madmen? The boxed set, right. 
It's worth watching. I'm paid by the moment. This is, this is the nudge. Um, Mad Men is about the advertising industry, and it, it describes the advertising industry as it really evolved at, its, at one of its most uh, horrendous periods in the 1950s and 60s through into the 70s on Madison Avenue, hence Mad Men. And it's horrible, and it's visceral, and it's compulsive viewing. And, the, and the, the hero is a man called Don Draper. Don Draper, who is himself an invention, uh, will do anything to get a contract and to make a profit and to move on in his career. And the messages are constantly about blood, lust, disgust, envy. Well, actually, I don't think that is the only sort of messages we should be using to... Um, change behavior, but we do need to know that actually there are those elements, the appeals to the type one behaviors, but there are also other elements which appeal to later evolved kinds of behaviors, and the choice is that we have before us in changing behavior may require combining those things, and some of the some of the things we want to engage with may well be rational, but they may be short-term rational rather than long-term rational. The long-term rational is much more difficult to deal with and much more difficult to get people to change their behaviours in relation to. So telling people to clean their hands... I often watch people in, in lavatories in places like this. I watch people in lavatories in places <laughs> like this. Try it yourself. Delay as you wash your hands. Observe how many people, even at the Royal Society, oh yes, I've spoken at some good places, <laughs> even at the Soci Royal Society of Engineers, is this Royal Society of Engineers, uh, actually often just tap their hands on the tap, and then that's it. And it's quite remarkable how the short term, the requirement to get back into the fray of the conference, defeats the long term of the issue of avoiding cross-infection. The rational is often not the way forward. We need to engage with many other things than that. Thank you very much. OK, I just, I just wonder whether we've got a Don Draper in the veterinary profession. Um, <laughs> So we've got a question here, which is uh, which is it's gathering a bit of momentum here. Actually, um, did you really just suggest that more women are prescribing more antibiotics because corporate practices are making them? Do you have any evidence to no. back that up? No, I don't have any evidence for it. It's an ongoing it's an ongoing discussion in term in, in on a piece of research which I've been trying to develop for the last couple of years, and. Um, there's, there, is, there is evidence from an American study which I heard, I heard presented at a conference last month. Um, we don't have any evidence from this country for that at all, and that will be one of the things that we would want to be um, looking at. But there is there's certainly a suggestion that the structures are there which would result in people having constraints on what they can or cannot prescribe and they, that people have targets uh, in terms of, uh, of the income that they're generating for the practice. So I'm not suggesting, I'm certainly not suggesting that uh, women are more likely than men to prescribe, um, to prescribe antibiotics. What I am suggesting is that contract, people working under certain kinds of contracts will be more likely to prescribe along with the corporate requirements of them. And given that there are more women vets than men vets in the younger um, uh, cohorts of the veterinary profession, then inevitably it is likely that women, more, that women will be prescribing antibiotics in larger numbers of the prescriptions than will men, because there are more women than there are men in the profession. So there you go. 
So I've got another question here, and uh, you know it's kind of it's kind of linked to actually. And does this link to the post-truth issues that people harden their views when faced with the counterfacts? That's an inter I don't know whether that's true. Actually, in fact, I'd like to know what Toby thinks about that one. Did you have a, a comment on that, Toby? So the question was, but certainly there's a lot that psychology can say about this post-truth phenomenon. Um, we talk a lot about the idea of confirmation bias, which is that we tend to reject information that sort of threatens our existing beliefs and worldviews. We distort it or easily forget it. We're quite selective, and we seek out information that corroborates our existing uh, assumptions and beliefs. And that can have quite profound impacts with the way or um, uh, consequences with the way that we wish to design messages and so on. We want to try and go with the grain of people's beliefs to get them to buy into the message, otherwise they're more likely to sort of shut us off from the outset. So. But it may also be the case that post-truth thinking is what appears when the truth is very complex. And complexity requires longer-term approaches to solving the problem. And in the face of the exigencies of daily life, and of just sheer complexity, people may choose to take a simple answer to a very complicated question. And the very notion of post-truth implies that the truth is so complex, I'd rather have this version of it. And Trumpism is the result. Oh. Thank you very much, Tony.